Hello everybody, welcome to the 3D Scanning and Motion Capture lecture. Uh, my name is Matthias Niesner and I'm happy to be the lecturer for this semester's lecture. Um, so I will be giving the lectures and we will also have Lukas Hörlein, Andre Burov and Artem Sevastopolsky who will help with the tutorials. So you will hopefully have a great time during the semester and first I would like to give a brief introduction of who we are. And then I would like to give a brief overview what are the cool things we're going to do um, this semester in our lecture. So to give a brief introduction about the team who is giving the lecture, so um, already said, my name is Matthias Niesner. Um, I'm heading the Visual Computing Lab here um, at the Technical University of Munich. Um, we're doing a lot of research on 3D reconstruction, 3D scene understanding, and the teaching assistants, Lukas Hörlein, Andrei Burov, and Artem Sevastopolsky, they're PhD students in my group, and they will help you with the exercises and also with the project. And I will give a bit of more introduction later on um, about all the logistics um, and all the things um, you need to know in order to participate in the lecture. Um, but maybe a first thing, um, what I wanted to say here is, so first of all, we will have lectures and tutorials, and in the lectures, um, most of the videos um, I will pre-record and I will put them on YouTube and there will be also Q&A sessions then afterwards, but more detail to that later. So first of all, I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about the motivation, why this lecture actually exists and most of the things um, that you will be hearing will be actually very closely related to things that we are doing in our group um, from a research perspective. So our day-to-day -day business um, as researchers at the university is essentially very tied to the concept and and things we're going to teach you during this lecture. So with that I would like to give a brief introduction about the research that is related to it because that is ultimately the motivation um, why I think specifically these areas in 3D scanning and motion capture are so cool and so interesting and how actually closely related they are to cutting-edge research that is being done in the research community at the moment. So one of the things um, that we are very interested in is we want to actually go ahead and understand 3D environments. So we want to figure out, for instance, um, well, you have a camera, it could be a 3D scanner, it could be also just standard RGB camera. But we want to figure out how to, how to capture a 3D environment and then we want to understand that environment, right? So for instance, if you're taking a 3D scan, this is something like this, what you see here. Um, this is a 3D model that has been uh, captured with a Kinect scanner. Um, more specifically with a structure sensor, actually. Um, but this 3D model is essentially the basis of many, many uh, downstream applications, such as semantic scene understanding, where, for instance, a robot or so would go ahead and figure out what's in that scene. But on the other hand, you're also going to have a lot of applications in uh, content creation, where you wanted to take these environments and then put them in AR, VR devices, and then you would like to uh, use that in order to see what's going on in your scene. Okay, so this is, for instance, um, a result here of some of the scans um, that you're getting um, if you're using methods like these ones. It turns out you can also use a lot of deep learning right now uh, in order to prettify these scans, uh, so you can complete these scans. You can also semantically understand these scans. And often if you see visualization like these ones here on the bottom right, um, these are semantic scans. So for every 3D point that we're capturing, we're also going to figure out uh, what the respective labels are. And this is actually one thing that we've been doing in our group for quite a while. Um, so Scanit is one of the popular benchmarks um, and datasets in this area where you essentially have ground truth annotations on top of 3D scans that are then being used um, for yeah, subsequent downstream tasks, for instance, robotics or um, virtual assistants that can kind of like virtually walk into the environment and so on. So there's a lot of applications basically where you need to, you need to understand the 3D environment. Um, and as part of this lecture, we want to we want to know what are the representation we can we can get in order to do semantic scene understanding, um, and how do we get these reconstructions to begin with? Um, so there's a lot of lot of works how we can combine 3D geometry and uh, RGB information uh, in order to get good semantic uh, understandings um, of of an environment. Uh, we we're also working actually a lot on on. Um, abstracting these 3D scans. So, for instance, we will see very quickly in in terms of methodologies when you're taking a 3D scanner, you're going to get a noisy point cloud typically, so you have to post-process this point cloud. Uh, one motivation is also for um, yeah, what I mentioned, like, down, like downstream tasks like content creation, 
where you wanted to get very clean uh, CAD-like um, reconstructions and representations. And this is something you can do here. For instance, you can take 3D scans, then retrieve and align CAT models to it. And then you can figure out uh, an abstract representation where you can then, again, do downstream tasks, for instance, robotics and so on. So if we're talking about high-level goals here, um, we want to basically figure out how to digitize the 3D world. Um, so I often say in the long run, we want to do kind of holograms. Um, one of my personal motivations is, of course, I'm in the area of AR VR. We want to figure out um, how can we create the content from real uh, scenes, right? So ideally, you take a bunch of photos of a scene and you get a, a, a 3D digital representation that ideally is kind of indistinguishable from the real world. And in order to get there, um, you're going you're gonna to have to kind of intersect a lot of different areas, right? Uh, on one hand, we're going to have a lot of computer vision methods, which um, will like, deal with like reconstruction, um, multi-view stereo methods, um, 3D scanning methods, and so on. On the other hand, you're going to have a lot of graphics methods that deal actually then with the 3D geometries, um, how to get the right 3D representation, and so on. And we're going to have to, to talk a lot about machine learning, um, specifically neural networks, in order to you know help these algorithms make them better, find correspondences, for instance, and things like these. So, so inherently, like all of the, the 3D scanning things that we're doing, this digitization, this high-level goal, um, is very correlated to, to an intersection of all of these 3D areas. Um, as part of this class here, we're often gonna, gonna refer to um, the, the sensor input is often an RGB camera, but most of the time, actually, it's, it's an RGBD sensor, such as a Microsoft Kinect. Um, we're only gonna use the Microsoft Kinect as kind of like one example for a depth sensor, but there's actually many, many other alternatives now. For instance, the new iPhone has actually a LiDAR scanner in it, which is kind of interesting. Or autonomous uh, cars have LiDAR sensors on top of them. And often for many of the methods you're gonna, gonna see here, um, we're gonna assume that we have RGBD input, meaning that we do have some depth measurements, right? And, but yeah, ultimately we would love to use just, just phones. Um, on the other hand, as I said, phones also like getting access to depth sensors. So it's kind of an interesting question whether we want to use RGB only, whether we want to use depth sensors. But the important thing is we're going to learn how and when do we use the respective sensors. Okay, a um, few more high-level goals. Um, we want to talk about reconstruction methods. So static reconstruction in 3D, dynamic reconstruction, so like moving environments. We want to talk about applications. So for instance, how do we use that content that we're capturing? Semantic scene understanding, I mentioned a little bit. But then for more content creation scenarios, uh, we're going to talk about movies and video games. Um, there's going to be different sensors. I hinted a few, RGB versus depth, right? But there's also, in terms of 3D scanners, there's also a lot of varieties, right? I mentioned the Kinect already. That's more on the lower end. That's like hundreds of, of, of bucks, basically, to buy one. But if, you, if you're buying an expensive 3D laser scanner, for instance, then, then like this gets into 10,000s of euros uh, in order to buy one. Um, then there's also different applications in terms of real-time versus offline applications. So if you're thinking about uh, semantic scene understanding, that often has to be real-time. So the scanning has to be also real-time there that gets these representations. Because if you have like a car or so that goes through a 3D environment, you capture the geometry there, uh, you have to get immediate feedback what's going on in the environment. Um, but sometimes if you're having, you know, you want to kind of create a virtual scene for your video game, then, then it's okay, possibly, to have some of this stuff um, offline. So I wanted to give a few applications here um, in terms of how to do 3D scanning. Um, one of the things is uh, capturing 3D geometry with laser scanners. So here we see an example where there's a laser scanner um, that scans the, the statue of, of David. It's a, it's a famous statue by, by Michelangelo. Um, and this is a project that was done at Stanford University um, by Markley Voice Group. And what they did is basically they, they bought a really, really expensive laser scanner. That's one of the cyberware scanners they had here. And this scanner basically was used in order to, to, to get very high fidelity geometry, um, uh, scan it in and get the, the respective 3D models. So these scans are still available online and it's kind of remarkable. This is already over 20 years now. 20 years in our area is actually quite something. But this was kind of one of the uh, first large scale efforts to, to go for digitization of art in a sense, right? Where you can take 3D scanners and get these uh, 3D models. So here the scanning process is pretty slow. Um, so this laser scanner takes quite a while. 
but on the other hand, um, the geometry is pretty accurate and pretty detailed, right? So this is kind of the the the, the most the biggest hammer you can imagine, right? You, you, you have a very expensive laser scanner here, gets you very detailed geometry, but on the other hand, it's also relatively slow. Um, you can also think about capturing geometry online, and this, I think, is one of, well, one of the first papers that, that I read uh, in this area. This was published in 2002 by Simon Rusinkiewicz, and this was one of the first reconstructions that was done online. So here you see they built this kind of they built their own um, laser scanner in a sense, uh, sorry, their own scanner here. So here they have a projector that emits a pattern, then they have a camera that records the respective structure here on the object. Um, and you, we will see how, how these kind of structured light scans basically uh, are working. But this is very remarkable because this was one of the first, or if not the first real-time reconstruction method um, of objects, right? So you had these handheld objects, you can move them around in front of the camera, and you got these reconstructions here actually in real time, which at the time was really remarkable. This was like 20 years ago, and since then, of course, a lot of things have happened, but I think this was really cool. Um, so here you see they use these stripe patterns, which is kind of funny, um, and they have a lot of different methodologies how to get actually the geometry then out of it, and this is one of the things we're going to also look into a lot of detail um, in this lecture. Um, but here, when, you, when we're talking about 3D scanning, right, of course, there's different um, domains as well. Um, there's also the question of large-scale capture. Um, this is an example of the Roman Colosseum. And here you want to basically take a combination of aerial footages, possibly even satellite images, right, and want to take a more photogrammetry approach. In this case, you're going to have many, many images, right? Um, you have to figure out how to align these images to register them correctly, and then you, you have to figure out how to reconstruct um, the respective geometry here. And, and this is like a completely different scale, of course, than, than doing like these handheld scans you've seen before. This is very large scale, um, and you don't get so much local detail, but of course you have other challenges to scaling this up um, to, to very large environments. And of course, we're not only talking about single buildings, we're even talking about like entire cities, right? If you're thinking about Google Street View, so they have a lot of data both um, with the streetcars, but they also have a lot of aerial images both from planes and satellites. And you can think about how to how to combine uh, all of these um, all of these modalities together in order to get a, a very good reconstruction. And for instance, Google Earth is is one thing that has emerged out of these kind of methods, right? So you kind of have reconstructions of entire cities now. Um, sometimes they look pretty good, sometimes they still need a bit of improvement, but it's kind of a really cool thing what you can actually um, do with it. Yeah, so, so far we've been talking a lot of the applications here where we have static 3D scans, but of course we could also think about um, humans in this case. Humans is a very specific scenario um, that is very interesting. So humans are very challenging to do. Um, so first of all, they tend to move. So Capturing them just in a static pose is often difficult. So, and then reconstructing moving humans is, is very hard. And um, and then at the same time, you're gonna have a lot of a lot of different complications with humans to reconstruct. So obviously you have cloth, right? Um, that's very difficult. So the topology is gonna change there. And then you have hair. Hair is a is a fascinating area of research that is that is very underexplored. So often when you see research papers, if you're looking at this one here, you see like this lady here, uh, she's actually wearing um, a hat, and the reasons were straightforward. They just they just don't want to deal with reconstruction of the hair, so they occlude it and making the process a little bit easier. Um, so this is an example of a multi-view stereo capture rig. So here you have a bunch of uh, DSLRs um, on a rig. Um, these cameras are typically calibrated, and what you have then is you have um, you have somebody who you want to scan, who is in front of that. You take a photo with many many cameras. And then you're doing things like multi-view stereo uh, in order to get the respective geometry, get the textures on top of it, and get these resulting 3D models. So we're going to learn how, how these multi-view stereo methods are going to work and how you get actually um, that, that level of fidelity from a reconstruction. Um, you can also even go you know, a little further and you know, probably one of the most sophisticated reconstruction systems that exists is, is a light stage. Um, this here is a light stage, which is a a setup that was built uh, by Paul Debevec's team um, uh, in, in Los Angeles. And this is what they're using in movies right now. So, so you see, this is like a light dome, 
it's um, it has a lot of LEDs here, so you can simulate real lighting, project this light on the respective person that is sitting in the middle here, and then you have a bunch of cameras, um, and that the cameras they they are they have it's also multi-view, right? So you have multiple cameras, and they can capture the different combinations of the lighting here. And with these light stages, you can not only capture the geometry, but you can also capture the reflectance um, of the respective uh, materials, such as skin, right? Skin is a very difficult material to capture, actually. And as I said, this is something what people use in movies today. Like, how do we, from a full, um, yeah, from a full, from a full uh, body reconstruction, how can we, for instance, insert a stunt double in a movie um, and, um, yeah, have have the respective actor digitized and then appearing virtually in a movie or a different movie and so on and edit it respectively with the digital representation. But these are these are really massive constructions, right? You, you can see there's like thousands of LEDs here. They have to be controlled. Um, the whole thing is, has probably a diameter of six to six to seven to eight meters. Um, so it's pretty massive, right? Um, and and the main goal here is to have you know the best quality reconstruction. Um, from both geometry and lighting um, of the respective person that you have inside. Um, you have also lower level, lower end um, reconstruction. This is another 3D acquisition method here. This is done again with a much uh, lower fidelity scanner here. Um, but you see there's kind of all these different ranges how you can get um, 3D geometry of humans, of bodies. And this is actually quite an interesting research area still, like basically how can we get these high fidelity scans, but without having to build like a multi-million dollar light stage, which is super expensive to do. Uh, in movies, one of the things you will also often see is um, motion capture. So motion capture typically in the context of movies, you see people that are wearing these mocap suits, right? So this is um, from Lord of the Rings. This is the, the, act, the actor, quote unquote, that played Gollum, right? So he was the he was the guy who was driving the virtual avatar here, and the idea was, well, you have these little markers on top of the person, right? These are I, 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 infrared reflective markers. Um, so that makes basically the tracking of the person much much simpler than if you didn't have those markers, right? Because you just have to follow them. Um, and then what happens is essentially that these these markers are being used to fit. Uh, the skeleton of the human that captures the animation of the human and then what they can do is they can do some animation transfer and can take the animation that they capture here and can transfer it to the virtual um, CG character, in this case the Gollum avatar, and he can essentially move the virtual avatar in the movie. And this is kind of cool, this is what motion capture in movies often refers to and of course there's, there's different systems that can do motion capture. There's commercial systems like Vicon and OptiTrack or so. Um, these are commercial settings that, that kind of have these mocap suits. And you can use those ones uh, to get very accurate, even relatively high frame rate tracking, actually. I think these ones are captured at up to 300 frames a second or so. Um, and at the same time, of course, you can also go into, into lower, lower fidelity motion capture. In principle, you can do motion capture even on a phone right now with a single RGB stream. Of course, you won't get quite the same quality, um, but we will examine um, what the pros, cons, and technically how to realize it is in this lecture. And I think this is kind of, it's really cool kind of to see the different systems, how to digitize the humans. Um, Lord of the Rings, of course, is a, is a very cool movie where they've done it. Um, a very famous movie is also Avatar. So here you see, it's not only the entire um, body that is being captured. So here what's kind of interesting in the Avatar movies, they have these uh, cameras on top of the face. You see this, what they have here in the face, right? Um, so with that, they get actually very, very high fidelity motion on human faces. So faces is, um, is a very specific, a specific application actually that is very, very hard to do because we humans, we are very sensitive if anything is off in the human face, actually, right? So, right, if, if, if I make some strange facial expressions, like you as the audience, you will immediately notice it, what I'm doing wrong here, um, or you will be very suspicious if my virtual character doesn't have the same fidelity of expressions. So, for instance, if you're looking at video games right now, even today, the facial expressions, the faces, generally speaking, they're still not at the level where you'd say, oh, they're like super realistic, so there's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, and this, I think, is kind of cool when you have these motion capture setups that capture the faces. So, um, like the Hollywood um, producers, they, they, they're spending a lot of money, actually, in, in building up these rigs. 
And even then in like Avatar, if you're looking at these kind of examples here, you, you will see they, they don't look that perfect yet, right? So even if you're looking here at the facial animation, it's, it's like, yeah, it works because it's kind of this, um, this bluish avatar here. But it's not, it's not like at the level of fidelity what a human face can actually do. So we're not quite there yet to say, oh, we could, we could transfer this on an actual other human, then it becomes a lot harder. So we, we can do it to some degree, but it still, um, it still takes quite some effort and it's not so easy. So we, we will get into this one. Um, also, again, how the technicalities here work. Okay, so I've talked a lot about humans. Faces is kind of interesting. Um, capturing geometry is, is super interesting. Um, this is a, a, a 3D reconstruction of a multi-story building here. This is captured with a, a Matterport scanner. Um, Matterport actually is a, is a company. They do real estate, um, well, virtual previews in a sense. So you kind of have a real estate agent. They scan your house. Um, then you have a 3D scan and you can put it online and other people can kind of see or tour your, your house virtually. And they have basically built a scanner that scans static geometry based on a bunch of Kinects. I mean, they use prime sense sensors. Um, they mount them on a rig. And this rig is then in, on a pod and this pod spins around. And then with a bunch of these pod locations, they can reconstruct uh, rooms like these ones. And I think... Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because they basically can relatively easily get multi-story building reconstructions here with the textures and for the application of um, looking into like real estate, that's kind of a very interesting application. There's also a bunch of, a bunch of geek applications here. This is also reconstructed with a Matterport scan. Um, and this is kind of funny because this is um, from Star Trek, um, the film set, and they reconstructed the film set of the, of the bridge of, of the Enterprise here. Um, which is kind of cool. And now they have this 3D model. And then, of course, all the diehard fans, um, they can go and virtually tour their film set accordingly, right? Um, and this is kind of interesting. Um, currently, these applications are more like, I mentioned real estate is one application. Um, there's going to be a lot of research actually going on right now to make these scans, not just getting some abstract geometry to it, but also make them look more photorealistic when you're re-rendering them. And this is a thing called novel view synthesis. I'll get to this in a second. Um, but there's a really, a really big, big market for that one too, because currently what we're doing with phones, right? We're going ahead and taking a bunch of pictures. We want to capture the memories. But once we took a picture, the viewpoint is fixed, right? So from a from a viewer's perspective, you would love to go ahead and changing the perspective here in order to look at the respective scenes from different angles. Yeah, one of the things I mentioned already a little bit was scene understanding. Um, the reason why I'm bringing scene understanding up here again is scene understanding is not something we're going to go too much into it in the course here, but scene understanding is something that, that typically is being done at the moment on top of these 3D scans. So for instance, from these Matterport 3D scans that you've just seen, um, we've done a lot of research on top of it um, to figure out automatically the semantics of the respective and Okay, we've talked a bit about, um, about personal avatars. Um, we've talked about, about humans. Face reconstructions in real-time settings is kind of an interesting thing. So here, one of the tasks you will often see is that you're going to have these, uh, oops, um, you're going to have these, uh, you're going to have here a single RGB input video, and then you're going to have this reconstructed face model on top of it, and you want to put this face model over it. Uh, and then you can do kind of interesting things uh, with the respective appearance of the face. Um, we will be talking about digital content, generally speaking. So this was a this was already a few years ago, but it was was quite popular in the media actually. Um, this is what Microsoft had been doing. They, they had these depth cameras here and here, here and here. These are basically stereo cameras. Again, we'll talk about what stereo cameras are, how they work. Um, but these these cameras basically give you depth data, and from this depth data, you can then create uh, a digitized environment and this environment you can use and stream in the respective AR devices here they have a hololens and for instance this this little girl here is kind of virtually added to the 3d scene and you can then kind of have a remote conversation uh, like telepresencing and so um, yeah and a lot of this stuff of course is is inspired by science fiction here right I mean you see like Star Wars and Star Trek um, the holodeck um, you saw in, in Star Wars when they had these kind of like little avatars here 
Um, this is kind of the fantasy what people had in the 80s, but I think we're not we're not so far away right now to actually making this come reality. Um, one question is of course how to see or how to visualize the stuff and which kind of devices do you do this in, a, in an AR VR device? Do you still do it on a 2D screen? Um, or do you do it with some sort of fancy 3D projection? That we're not going to talk too much about in this course. This is more an imaging question, also super interesting and difficult. But we're going to talk about how to actually capture, reconstruct, and potentially visualize the respective 3D content. Okay. Um, yeah, here's a couple of, of more examples. Um, here's um, here's some work what we have been doing. This is bundle fusion. It's kind of a state-of-the-art reconstruction paper. Um, funny enough, this is a paper that doesn't even use deep learning. Um, and I'm saying this because a lot of the methods we're going to see will also be using deep learning. Um, but um, this is kind of the, the, the fidelity of geometry you can get. Um, one thing that's kind of cool is I wanted to play this video here. Um, so just to see a little bit how, how 3D scanning in a, in a commodity setting works is. This is a, a real-time reconstruction. So here you see me holding a, a, a structure scanner. It's basically a mobile connect. Uh, on an iPad, um, and then you can do some recording here. Uh, you're getting the, the real-time feed of the depth sensor that is attached to the iPad here. And in the bottom right, you're going to see how the reconstruction is, is growing and continuing of the environment. And on the screen in the middle, you actually see the live preview of the reconstruction from a camera's perspective. Yeah, one of the things was kind of cool. We're going to talk about how to do the registration correctly, um, how to do the alignment and so on correctly. But you see here, this is a real-time system, and it's actually it's actually not so easy to get these kind of things to work. For instance, if here you see when the camera is occluded, um, that's a very challenging scenario. We're going to call this then relocalization, when the the, the the slam system basically has to figure out how to recover the tracking. Um, and these kind of things are, are technically actually quite challenging, and it's not so easy to realize. Um, but this is one of the state-of-the-art systems that currently exists with RGBD scanners um, and is being heavily used in the academic communities in order to capture 3D data. At the end of the day, you're going to get meshes that, that look like these ones here. And yeah, you can load in a mesh lab and then, then view the scene. So for us, this is kind of cool, super exciting. Um, I mentioned a little bit uh, the semantics on top of it. This is kind of a thing. Um, again, we're not going to talk too much about semantics, I think, in the course, but I just wanted to to show you like the whole like involvement of research that we've been doing in this area. Um, so here we, we're having them 3D scans. Um, we semantically annotated these um, in order to do some 3D scene understanding on top of it. So now we have some data and on top of that again we developed some, some methods um, to do uh, instant segmentation, to do semantic segmentation in order to understand what's in the scene. There's a lot of neural network stuff going on. We've also worked a lot about scene completion and shape completion. So basically one of the, the arguments we're always having is that, oh, if you're only having partial 3D scans, how can you go ahead and figure out what the, the remaining geometries that you haven't scanned? Um, and this is kind of an interesting scenario because these kind of partial input scans is, is a thing you're always going to deal with in this area. So you're always going to have this issue that we're going to have to deal with a lot of, a lot of partial geometries. Um, and this makes it harder to make it, you know, usable in a video game yet from, from these reconstructions. So we, we talked a lot about how to shape completion in this case, right? We're going to take an input, an input scan here that is partial, and then we want to figure out how to get the respective ground truth um, reconstruction. Um, you can do this not only on objects, you can also do this on entire scenes. This is a paper called Scan Complete, right? You have a partial input scan here. You can complete the scan, you can also figure out, um, you can predict the semantics and so on at the same time. Um, here's, here's another example. This is input scan, target scan, right? And you can see here actually, yeah, the final scan gets you almost to, to, to like hand model geometry um, that, that then can be used in some content creation scenarios. Okay. Uh, we've done a bunch of instance completion here. Um, I guess I don't want to go into too much detail here, but here the idea is kind of, oh, can you combine the ideas of, of knowledge of semantics um, with the respective geometry? So the idea was, oh, can we actually use the semantics to get better reconstructions and so on? 
Um, you can do part-based scene understanding. Um, here, you, it's not only about um, well figuring out what's in a scene, but here it's about you know what are the respective parts, and this is like finer finer fidelity scene understanding. Um, one thing that is kind of interesting is in the in the scanning, it's not only about the geometry, of course. Um, here, here's a work that actually looks into capture and colors and textures. Um, so we're going to have a 3D model, and on top of this 3D model, you're going to have a bunch of textures. Um, and this is actually surprisingly difficult to reconstruct because for the most part, you're going to deal with misalignment issues. How do the textures respectively fit on the geometry? And how can you can you make them look good, right? If you want to use this this geometry at the end of the day, um, how how is it how is it uh, you know how can you texture it correctly? What a good texture representation and how do you optimize on the texture? This is some stuff we're going to look into a little bit more, like how do we texture reconstruction top of geometry? How do you make this one look realistic um, and so on? So here's a yeah here's a couple of cool um, results. Um, this is on object basis. Um, but you can also do this on an on a on a scene combined. Um, yeah, this is already like this is doing everything in a sense. This is like taking partial input geometry um, and then completing um, the geometry as well as the textures. There's a lot of methodologies right now behind it. There's a, a thing called differential rendering that is kind of um, cool. And yeah, in this case, the goal is to get high fidelity reconstructions um, with textures on top of them. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about capturing static parts. Um, I said I wanted to talk a bit more about, about faces still. Faces are super important. We're going to have specific lecture, lecture slots um, allocated to face reconstruction. One of, the, one of the very popular work from our group actually was this face-to-face -face, um, by Justus Thies. And here the idea is you wanted to go ahead and have a webcam here. Um, that is here, right? It captures his face, and based on the motion of his face, the idea is to reanimate an existing video. So it's like controlling the face of a different of a different person. And here the idea is, um, what you do is you first go ahead and reconstruct a face template of that person. You do the same thing for the other person, and then transfer the motion between the reconstructed face templates. So the expressions of the face from my face would be transferred to a target video's face, um, and then this face is being re-rendered on top of the target face, right? So here the idea is that you have here the original video of Bush, and then this one is being re-rendered and reanimated, and this way you can kind of virtually control this. Um, so this is actually working in real time, which is kind of interesting. That's one of the novelties uh, when we published the paper um, and got quite some attention for obvious reasons, because now you can suddenly control um, videos and faces. So in, in practice, this looks like this, right? So you have here. You have a source actor, you have a target actor, and now the source actor here is reanimating the target's actor's face. Right? So you see that the mouth motion is kind of one-to-one -one controlled here. Uh, and this works in real time, and this is kind of cool. Um, you can do a lot of a lot of fun things with that. Um, and people are doing this, of course, in movies for stunt doubles, um, but they typically didn't do it in real time, so this is one of the things that got actually also quite some, some, some media attention. And it's kind of interesting, and since then there have been a lot of follow-up works um, that kind of create possibly even a bit more fidelity, higher resolution outputs. Um, but it's kind of cool because now you can go ahead and actually edit videos and faces. You can possibly do video dubbing and translate um, in different languages and make sure the lip sync and so on works out. Um, but you can also do kind of fun things. This is kind of a fun project that we've done. Um, here we just mapped an IMU here um, that measures the acceleration here from the hand uh, and we're mapping it to the respective reconstructions of the model and with that we can control the mouth um, which you know leads to these kind of um, interesting interesting effects that give you some um, some pretty cool output renderings yeah I think that was that was kind of cool um, and yeah, there's a for this kind of research. There's of course uh, a lot of a lot of serious applications behind it too, right? Um, one of the things is uh, the face VR project. Basically, the idea here is um, can you actually communicate between two people that are using VR headsets? And the obvious problem you're going to very quickly realize is if you're wearing a VR headset, you kind of like the webcam in front of you um, cannot see your actual face, right? Because it's occluded by the VR headset. And the question is, can you actually remove 
um, the head-mounted display and give you give you videos of the original face um, rather than having these uh, these videos feeds with the head-mounted displays. And in practice, something like this looks like that here, right? So here's the left-hand side, the actual source actor, and then the output is the respective uh, stereo target here that will be projected on the conversation partner. Uh, so we are headset, and then you can basically communicate as if you didn't wear any any VR goggles. And I think that's kind of important, right? Because um, I mean, there's a question of like how good are the VR devices and stuff like this, of course. But one question here is like how do we actually communicate between people that are wearing these headsets, and how do we get their actual faces being captured and then uh, probably displayed for kind of a conversation that is kind of interesting. Uh, you can also do this kind of reenactment applications, not just on the face. You can do this on the on the whole upper body here. Um, this is a video from us. Um, um, I think this should animate, right? So here you can basically not just animate the face, but basically the whole upper body. Uh, the core concept here is relatively similar, right? Um, it's basically giving me a reconstruction of the of the three D uh, face of the three D body. Um, and then use it as a as a proxy model in order to re-render it under different uh, under different animations. I can, can name play this one again. Right so here, it's kind of the this is like a synthetic output video that's kind of reenacted by by the respective source motion here. Okay, um, yeah. Then there's a, a couple of dynamic reconstruction methods. That's something we haven't talked about now. Um, here, the idea is instead of like having priors and like in faces of bodies, can we actually do completely freeform reconstructions? Um, here, there's no prior. This is called um, well, dynamic reconstruction is a paper from us called volume deform. Um, the, the the idea is to kind of do a uh, kind of a volumetric fusion approach where you're taking depth maps from different viewpoints and you're actually getting these um, 3D models. Okay, this is like how this looks in practice. So here we're seeing uh, we have color input, right? Um, this is the live, this is actually also real-time reconstruction. Um, and this is actually kind of cool in terms of the, the resulting reconstruction quality that you're getting here um, of the 3D models. Um, and this is actually quite challenging task, right? Because you have to not only track the camera here, um, like in FLAM systems, but in fact, you also have to figure out non-rigid correspondences on top of the surface that, um, that help you to, to guide the reconstruction and so on. Um, funny enough, there's also a lot of things now with neural networks, of course. Um, this is a, a paper we had last year called Neural Parametric Models. Now we can learn how to regularize these dynamic reconstructions. Um, there's a lot of things with NLP-based representation. Um, there's a lot of intersections with the machine learning community right now, um, how to parameterize that. So we're going to look into these kind of things as well. Um, you don't necessarily need to have so much of a background here in deep learning. Um, but um, it's kind of interesting how these how these different areas actually um, get together. Yeah, I think the whole rotation video. This is the thing from from Microsoft. We looked at this one already. I'm gonna, gonna play this one again. So here was this idea that you had this this person that is being reconstructed here in real time, right? They had these cameras here on top of it, um, and they got these these reconstructions where you can now virtually insert another person into the view here that is not actually there, right? So now they're wearing HoloLenses, then they can see each other also. And this is kind of cool, like if you're thinking about how is a meeting gonna, gonna be conducted in the future, right? Um, you are uh, wearing the respective like AR devices in order to, uh, yeah, do this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, we're going to look definitely at these kind of things. So at the end of the course, you will definitely know how these kind of things work. We're also going to look at um, normal view synthesis. I mentioned this already. So here the idea is you want to have a viewpoint. And from this viewpoint, you can then create new viewpoints and, and look at this. There's a thing called normal radiance field and short nerve. Um, that's a very popular research direction. So we're definitely going to have a look at this normal rendering techniques, how they work. And I think that's super hot right now. Um, basically, this I think doing it for dynamics would be cool. That's not quite there yet, but um, this is like super hot research at the moment. Um, how do you basically capture reality in a photorealistic fashion 
and then re-render it under different viewpoints. So this novel view synthesis problem um, is something we're going to look into more detail, and I think that's going to be that's going to be pretty cool. Um, some of the research that's also really relevant to the course here is this phase head reconstruction we've been doing for a while. Um, here we have some input videos. You're going to get some 3D um, reconstruction here from the head. You can animate that head. You can do reenactment here. Um, it's also a bit of a combination between neural networks right now, but you don't need to know so much neural networks, but the more important thing we're going to look at is how the, how the reconstruction is going to work in practice. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm through. I wanted to give you, like, I hope I didn't, didn't overwhelm you right now. These were basically a bunch of our own research results um, that, we, that, that I think is very relevant to this course here and is motivated by a lot of things in this course. Um, so don't be intimidated. Like, of course, at this point, you don't know necessarily yet how all of these kind of things work, but that's why you're here for. And at the end of the day, we're gonna, gonna figure out all the methodologies, how, how, to, um, how to actually do these kind of things, how to get reconstructions that look so good. How do we do this with, with cameras, with RGBT sensors, with laser scanners possibly, and so on. So I wanted to give a bit of an overview about the logistics of the course. I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we're going to structure lectures, exercises, tutorial sessions. So this is what we're going to do now in the second part here. So in terms of the lectures, um, this is very preliminary, but I wanted to give you a bit of an overview how we're going to structure the lectures itself. Um, so all of these lectures, they will be pre-recorded. That's something I already said, right? Um, I'm going to upload these ones um, to YouTube um, and we'll make it accessible to everybody. And the idea is probably one lecture here is going to be one recording. I'm trying to release those recordings um, typically. So I'm doing them typically on the weekends um, and then I'm releasing them at the respective lecture times. Um, and so far we are planning with around 11 lectures. Um, we're going to start with basic concept of geometry. That's what we're going to do next week. So actually, today's lecture zero, or lecture zero is the introduction of you know why we're doing the lecture, why it's so cool, and why I'm so excited about it. Um, but next week we're going to start with basic concepts of geometry. Um, then we're going to go lecture, lecture two about surface representation, like a lot of things. What you know maybe from computer graphics already, like uh, 3D meshes, voxels, implicit representations, and so on. Um, we also going to then in the third lecture we're going to talk about how to do reconstructions. Um, this is very related to the second lecture because the respective representation dictates what reconstruction methods go. Um, in lecture four, we're going to talk about nonlinear optimization for these reconstruction methods. Um, here it's actually kind of interesting. Um, when I when I did this kind of research, we already actually had a lot of math lectures for nonlinear optimization, so we knew how gradient descent works, we knew how Gauss Newton, Levenberg Mark worked, these kind of things work. But most of the time in the math lectures I forgot it actually and then I had to relearn it. Um, so but here we wanted to really apply it to directly to these reconstruction methods. So I hope with these practical examples um, we can also go a bit a bit beyond the high level and can go in, in depth, you know, how to how to do the proper optimization methods and what's the math behind it. We will talk about rigid surface tracking and rigid surface reconstruction. Rigid typically means we have a static scene um, and we have only a moving camera. That's in a sense an easier scenario because we only have for the camera six degrees of freedom, meaning the, uh, the transformation of the respective camera. Um, and then in, in lecture six, we're going we're gonna to expand it to dynamics and non-rigid surfaces which means there we have a lot of degrees of freedom suddenly because we have freeform surface deformations. We're going to talk about non-rigid tracking and non-rigid reconstructions in Lecture 7 then, basically um, the inverse of Lecture 6. Um, and then in Lecture 8, we're going to talk about phases, um, how basically phase models, how we can create statistical models tailored to phases. Phases are very special in a sense on the reconstruction side. They're very difficult, um, also important. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of methodologies that figure out how to get good phase reconstructions. We're going to talk about uh, human body reconstructions in lecture nine and hand tracking. Um, one thing is kind of interesting, like faces, bodies, and hands is kind of the other three domains that are always very specific to reconstructions. First of all, because they have a lot of applications in, in like video games and movies. 
Um, but also because they're really difficult to do, actually. Like, hands is very hard. Like, if you want to reconstruct a hand, like, you see that it's very, very difficult. Um, the, 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 the degrees of freedom my hand can move is very hard uh, to reconstruct. So you have a lot of um, self-occlusions, which makes the reconstruction actually quite challenging. It needs a lot of regularization. It needs specific um, statistical models in order to achieve that. We're going to talk about lighting and materials. I already mentioned things like a light stage. Um, this is kind of a brute force way to get lighting and materials to be reconstructed, but we're also going to talk about lighting and material representations in terms of reconstruction. And then in lecture 11, um, I haven't, uh, probably this is the last lecture then, we're going to talk about novel fuse synthesis and neural rendering. So um, these NERF kind of things, what I mentioned, um, by the way, if you're interested in this area, just Google NERF, um, neural radiance field, a super interesting research area right now, um, really, really Really, really exciting progress in the last two years, I would say. So this is all cutting edge. Um, what you can do now with the newest with the newest research methods. Yeah. So one thing. Um, this is roughly the content that I've mentioned for the lectures. It can change a little bit. Um, one reason why it can change actually a lot of these things that we're going to talk about. What I'm always trying to do in these in these lectures is I'm trying to keep keep it very close to the latest research results. And you saw this on these papers that we've just seen. Some of them actually just appeared this year. Right, so um, it is also possible that I'm going to change the lecture content a little bit, getting the very latest research results in, what um, the research community has been producing, um, and I'm always trying to make sure at the same time to have the respective basics connected to these uh, latest research results. So yeah, this is roughly what I'm imagining for the for the lecture. Um, again, subject to change, but um, the goal is definitely to have a lot of foundations um, at the end of the day that is being very, very closely tied to, to the latest research papers that have recently come out. Okay, so in addition to the lecture, we're going to have tutorials. And tutorials are basically um, exercises in and, and a project. I'll get to this in a second, what this means. Uh, there's a few requirements, and um, I know, um, yeah, I know that <laughs> it is kind of funny. Like, I mean, it's a computer science class, but I think it's, it's very much expected that you have to know C++. Um, Please, after the lecture, don't show me an email, oh, I don't use C++, uh, what do I do? Um, if you don't know it, you might not be able to do the lecture exercises, right? We are not we are not teaching you C++, right? This is just a thing you have to know, and the exercises will be in C++. Um, if you're doing anything in the real world today and you don't know C++, you're pretty much lost anyway. So this is a, if you don't know it, this would be a good time to catch up on it. But this is something we're not going to teach you. We're expecting you to know it, right? Um, and yeah, like setting up your programming environment and stuff like this. I mean, this is not this is a master course. Um, we're expecting you to figure out how how to know how to code. You know, we expect you to, to, to set up a programming environment, set up make files, social studio. So um, I think that this should be something that is that is doable at this point. Okay, uh, we also expect that there's 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 some knowledge in, in linear algebra, right? Um, you should definitely know how to solve a linear system. You should know um, how how matrix operations work, what are eigenvalues, eigenvectors of matrices. This is just standard stuff. Um, I'm expecting this to, to be known. Again, I mean, I, this is not an intro class for math. Like, this is just something we expect you to know. Um, again, please don't shoot us emails afterwards. Oh, I don't know basic math. Can I still take the course? If you don't know it, I would recommend probably not to take it. Um, and rather go ahead and first take the basic courses. Like, this is, this is, not, this is meant as an advanced course in a master's study. Like, we expect basic linear algebra foundations here, right? This is something you should know. Um, there should be also some concepts about 3D graphics. This is less of a prerequisite that you have to know all of computer graphics, but a little bit of, of stuff from computer graphics would be definitely, definitely helpful here as a prerequisite. Okay, but this is something, you know, you it might be also good to take graphics courses in parallel. That would be very useful. Um, but, but for the first two bullet points, there's pretty much no compromise. You have to know how to code. You have to know basically the algebra. It's just, that's just it, right? Okay, um, a little bit in terms of the format. So, um, well, the lectures are going to be online videos. I mentioned this already. This is going to be the content. Um, this will be uploaded every week. We're going to send you the respective videos. Um, most of these things will be announced via Moodle. So on Mo if you're signed up to online, which I assume you are, otherwise you probably wouldn't see the video. Um, then you would, um, then we will send you the respective update links, including the slides of the PDFs, um, every week. 
Um, we will also have a live Q&A for the lectures. This will be done via Zoom. Um, it's probably during the time slot of the lecture, um, but I will announce that. So this is basic. If you have specific questions, you can just join the Zoom uh, and you can ask me questions. I will be around there. It's kind of like a virtual way of office hours, right? Um, and um, we can chat if there's anything unclear to the lectures. I think for the most part, this is always kind of cool to talk about it. Uh, this will be announced um, when exactly it is. Next week, there's, there's no such slot because I'm actually traveling at a conference. I'll be at Eurographics in Rams. Um, so this will, this will not happen next week, but in the weeks afterwards, there will be a slot, probably on Friday afternoon, um, when, when there will be office hours. Okay, there will be tutorials meaning they will, they will be uploaded with the lectures. So sometimes there will be some content too, like some introduction, how to use respective things. I'll let the TAs decide how to do that exactly. Um, but there will be definitely some guidance and help in terms of how to do the exercises and projects. There will be some respective introductions. Um, most of the content we're just gonna post on Moodle. So you can just look that one up. Um, there will be office hours for the TAs as well. So the, the, the live Q&A for the lecture is kind of where you can ask me stuff. But for everything related to the exercises, you have to talk to the TAs um, and you can just send them emails basically, right? So one of the things is we have three TAs actually. Um, this is kind of a, a very good ratio. So I'm trying to make sure that everybody gets the right advice they need um, during the exercise sessions and you can just contact the TAs for Zoom appointments and they just schedule a date with you. So they, they, they will make the time. Um, one thing very important, please, you, you have to use Moodle. Every announcement will be done via Moodle. So everything is, is you, you should check that, like we're posting all the content there and so on. Okay, in terms of the organizations of the tutorials, um, so we're going to start with part one, which is basically like what you're used to from most other courses. This is basically a, a, a bunch of small exercises that are like one to two week basis. And these ones are, are to be completed. They're gonna be submitted. They will be corrected. You're gonna get a score on them. Everybody here will have to do the same exercises there, right? This is like a weekly programming exercise if you wanna, wanna have it this way. This is about implementing basic concepts. It's learning by doing, and it's gonna be in C++. Again, we're not gonna to explain to you how C++ works. This is something we expect you to know at this point. Okay. In the tutorials, um, what this means is this is roughly from April 26th to June 10th. This is our preliminary schedule, how we, we map this out. So half of the course will be dedicated for these practical parts where you have basically weekly or bi-weekly exercises. Afterwards, we have a second part. This one is, is a little bit different. There we will have a final project. So for the final project, here we will split into small groups, so typically into groups of four to five, and every group here will work on one project. They will select the projects by themselves, for instance, doing a phase reconstruction method, phase tracking methods. We'll get into detail what kind of specific topics we can do there, um, but what I want to say is the final projects, they are not the same for everybody, so everybody here, or every team or every group here, will work on a different on their individual project. Um, I'll get to this in a second, um, how this gets in detail, and we will guide you through with how the process works. But basically what's important to know at this point is we're gonna have two parts. One of them is the regular exercises, they are the first half of the semester, and the second half is for a final project. Um, and typically, I mean, I'm always super excited. Um, I was both actually as a student, as a professor, I was always excited about the projects because that's where like the good people can really shine. This is always super amazing. Everybody does something very creative and different, and I think that's that's kind of really cool. Okay, if there are questions and problems, the first thing you should do, please ask in Moodle. This is the very first thing to do, because if you have a question, for instance, if I forgot to mention something here in the lectures, or if the TAs forgot to mention something in the exercises, or if something is unclear, generally speaking, ask in Moodle, because other people might also want to hear the results there, right? They wanna see what happened, with X, Y, and Z, and they might, they might actually also benefit from the respective answers. So if you have questions, please ask on Moodle first. Only then send us emails and then schedule Zoom in-person meetings. So if you have any questions regarding the exercises, 
ask on Moodle. Afterwards, depending on the result there, ask the TAs. Please don't email me, for instance, for the exercises, because I might not know the answer, right? I can mostly only forward it to the TAs, respectively. Especially when it comes to the projects later on. Basically, what we're going to do there is we're going to have projects being assigned to respective TAs. So the TAs will know specifically your project, what you're working on, right? So they will guide you through the project specifically. So, yeah, this is quite important, actually, that you're asking the right things. Please, please don't... Not everybody asks me directly via email because otherwise I get too many emails and I might not be able to answer them all anymore. Okay, in terms of the organization, this is our preliminary timesheet and we can debate that. Um, this might change, depends a little bit. Um, but what's important is there's going to be fixed upload times, meaning that there's an introduction of new exercises happening on Friday and there's a submission of new exercises on Friday midnight basically right and the solutions from the previous exercises are then respective on mondays until the final project starts this is going to repeat right so this is very important that you know when the submission deadlines are and it's important for you to know that you start early respectively and don't push it to the last minute okay so rough timeline um release of exercise one probably may may 6th um, this is probably when we're going to start, um, unless something major changes, um, but in that case we will let you know in Moodle. So this is our preliminary time frame, how we're going to get started, and when you have to expect roughly what to go. So re releases on, on May 6th then, right, and on May 13th in this case would be uh, the exercise deadline, but also the release then of the next one. And then the solution uh, would, be, would be announced and discussed. Um, the week afterwards, right? This is what we want to do. So release, the one week later is the deadline of the current one, release of the next one, and then the week later is, the, um, is talking about the respective solutions of the exercise. Okay. Okay, I mentioned it. Uh, office hours, please use the Moodle. I cannot only re-emphasize this enough. Please use Moodle because other people might benefit from that. Um, for harder problems or if something is not so easy to be solved on Moodle right away, Schedule a meeting with us, email the TAs respectively. Here are the email addresses. There's Andre, Lucas, and Artem's email address. These email addresses are pretty, uh, pretty important if you have any specific questions. Um, these will be just, typically they will just schedule Zoom calls with you, or they can also do it in person. So we are all in the office actually, um, and we can in principle also do in-person meetings. Um, depends of course a little bit how the whole uh, pandemic situation is gonna develop, but for the most part, um, we can do both, actually, depending on whether you're here or not. Um, oh, yeah, one important thing, generally speaking, if you are not on campus, it's not the end of the world, you can do everything in principle online. So um, the only thing I'm not sure yet is, is about the exam, but, but this one later. But for the most part, everything can be done online. If you are, Even if you are abroad in principle, this is okay uh, from our end. Um, okay, so... The exercises I mentioned already, we have gonna, we're going to have these, these five small self-contained exercises. They are a, a week of, of workload. Uh, deadlines are always Friday midnight. That's important. What's also important is they're groups of two. Um, what's critical in a sense is what you need to know, like how much does it matter for the grading. Uh, so there will be a great bonus of 0.3. Um, so... If you're submitting all five exercises, you pass at least four, and the fifth one is kind of past borderline, um, then you're gonna get the grade bonus. If you're missing exercises, just by definition, you won't get the grade bonus. And this, however, is only applicable if you already passed the exam. So in other words, if you were to fail the exam, the grade bonus could not save you. Um, there's going to be the obvious answer, right? A uh, question right now that always happens. Um, well, it's a great bonus of 0.3. You can ask how important is it. I'm going to be very pragmatic. It is very, very important. Uh, me personally, I am not taking any master thesis students uh, for thesis guided research or IDPs who are not having exercises done in lectures like these. It's very simple. And I keep a list of all of these ones around. So for me personally, maybe this doesn't show up in your transcript, but if you want to do ever a thesis with us, 
um, then you probably want to make sure that you do these exercises properly. I'm just going to say this informally in a sense, um, but for me personally, exercises are really important, and especially the project is important. If you ever want to, like, or if, if you want to get, like, recommendations or something like this, you need to have good projects. Without the projects, it's just, you just have taken a lecture and taken an exam and nobody knows you. But the projects are actually a thing where you can actually shine, right? This is a thing where you can be creative, you can kind of do your own thing that you like doing, um, and this is an opportunity, in a sense, to stand out. So, so please use it, right? We are spending time to help you there, but we are also expecting that you put in the effort accordingly. Okay, um, there's also a preliminary outline in terms of the exercises. So this is basically about, mostly about 3D reconstruction methods at the beginning. We're going to talk about, the first exercise will be about camera intrinsic back projection meshes. Second exercise will be about surface representation, volumetric fusion sign distance fields. Uh, third one is going to be our crust method, how to basically line point clouds. Uh, fourth exercise will be about optimization. And the last, the fifth exercise is about optical alignment and ICP. ICP is iterative closed point. Uh, that's one of the methods um, that is going to be pretty important for, for all of these 3D scanning um, methods. Right. This is roughly what we planned. Um, I think that's probably going to be fixed. I don't think we're going to change that too much. Um, whereas the lectures we might change because I want to put in a bit of neural rendering in because I think it's kind of cool. Um, but this is roughly what we're planning in terms of exercises. Again, first half of the semester. Second half will be the final project. Um, I already mentioned a few things there. Um, we're going to repeat this, of course, in the in the tutorial sessions, but um, just to give you a bit of a heads up here. Um, here, we're going to start in the middle of the semester. We're going to do three reconstruction tracking projects. There's a lot of cool projects. We're going to help you define projects, of course. It's going to be definitely five to seven weeks long. Um, we haven't set up, of course, all the deadlines, but this is roughly what we had in mind. Uh, groups are going to be here three to four for, for what we're planning right now, but this is also something we have to see how many people we are. It could be that it's four to five. Um, so let's say three to five. I'm, I'm putting three to four. This is what we're planning. But for the, for the early exercises, it's definitely two people per group, and here it's going to be three to four. Um, okay, then the proposal is first going to be done by writing an abstract of one to two pages. Basically, here we want to see, are you able to figure out a project on your own? Are you able to describe this? Um, and then we're going to have a presentation of the project in abstract with two pages of results at the end of the project, right? This is kind of the formalities. Um, we're going to go over this one into more detail. But what I'm trying to say here is like half of the semester will be dedicated to a project where you can decide what you want to do, um, whereas the first half will be more about smaller uh, self-contained exercises. Okay, uh, one thing that is always very important to students <laughs> is the final exam. Um, there's going to be two things. Um, one of them is the questions covering the lecture content. Um, this is obvious, right? This is probably going to be about, I don't know exactly the ratio you get, but it's, it's a little more than half, but not, not too much more than half. Um, and then it will be questions to the respective final project that you have been doing. Here the trick is very straightforward. The reason why we're doing this is we want to make sure that the final project accounts for a significant part of the grade. Right? So for once this is important. So this grade, basically how well you're doing in the projects, will essentially determine a significant part on how your exam will be doing. And this is how we're making sure that your effort that you're putting into the project will be directly reflected in your final grade in the project. Again, note that the project grades and the project points, they will basically be part of the exam. We will, we'll just compensate for that. And the great bonus for the exercises at the beginning, these point three that you can get, they're different things, right? So the point three great bonus at the beginning is only going to be for the weekly exercises for the first half of the semester. For the project, the grading part is only for the second part of the semester. Okay. Um, at this point, there's one thing that is not sure that we are not sure yet, whether we will do the exam in person or online. Um, and it's probably for the most part out of our hands. I intended to do it online via Zoom. First, I was a bit skeptical whether this would work, but in the past, this has worked relatively well. So this is something we might do. 
we will let you know this depends a little bit on the university policies and how the pandemic is going to evolve we don't know for sure yet simply right that's the honest answer here um, but yeah we will let you know okay this is exam uh, I think grading is pretty clear, right? So we're going to have the exercises at the beginning. That's point three grade bonus. We're going to have the project and the lectures. And the project and lectures will both be part of the exam, basically. Um, and we will, and this is going to determine most parts of the grade. Okay. Logistics. Again, quick summary here. Uh, we're going to have the TAs, Andre, Lucas, Artin. Um, they are super excited to help you on this. Um, they will talk with you about a lot of problems that you have, they will help you and advise you on the projects. You're going to have the lectures, we're going to have a Q&A slot. Tutorials will be uploaded to the lectures, but they're the focus on exercises and projects. Uh, we're going to have office hours, um, emails for the TAs for the Zoom appointments. We're going to have exercises. Exercises, um, we have five in total, at least that's what we have planned. Um, all exercises you have to at least pass four out of five, and the fifth one should be at least borderline. So we have to you have to submit all of them. It's a point three grade bonus. First exercise. Will, this is not quite true. It's not next week, but it's the Friday in the week basically. Well, no, it's next week. Sorry, I'll add, like I'll take it back. Um, I'm recording this just one week earlier, so for me it's in two weeks, but for you it will be in one week. Um, so the exact deadlines um, are going to be always. Uh, on Friday evenings uh, for the deadlines here. Yeah. Okay, uh, projects, one final project, five weeks for completion, five plus weeks, it's probably going to be five to seven weeks. Um, project features in final exam, that's important, that's very critical, right? Because I want to make this very clear that the project score you're getting will basically determine the, the exam score uh, on these project questions that you will have later on. Okay. That's mostly the logistics. If you have any other further questions, please just ask in Moodle. That's the easiest thing. Um, and then I'm very much looking forward to next week because next week we are going to talk about 3D concepts and um, we're going to talk about 3D meshes, voxel grid, implicit surface representations. And I'm very, very excited about getting started with the technical stuff here because that's going to be pretty amazing. And this is super, super cool to talk to. So thanks a lot for the first lecture. Um, thanks for, for joining. Hope to see you next week. See you.